Lulu, thank you so much for uh, making the time on the P2P Fireside series. Excited to be talking to you. Thank you so much, Deepak. I've been such a huge fan of your podcast. I've listened to so many of them over many years. They've given me so much value and I'm super honored to actually be talking to you today. Nice. Thank you so much for the kind words and the, and the feeling is mutual. And congratulations on the, on the newly uh, published book, Go Further Faster. Thank you so much. Very excited. Absolutely. And uh, we will uh, explore the book uh, down the conversation. But in this series of conversations, we actually uh, explore people's journeys and choices and, and, and their leadership career. So I like to take you back in time and uh, uh, sort of curious about how you even entered this world of branding and advertising after a BA in economics. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't seem like a linear jump. So I'm curious about uh, even how you, how you sort of uh, got into this field. Great question, Deepak. Actually, those that I grew up with in school and in college wonder how I ended up in advertising and marketing because in school, I was a hardcore science student, mm -hmm. maths, physics, chemistry, if you will. I even did computer science, I think, in 10th standard. And then when I went to college, I discovered economics and business, really fell in love with it. But neither of those would lead you to marketing. Mm. What happened was that at the end of my last year in college in the US at Davidson mm -hmm. in North Carolina, having done really well in economics, I was shortlisted for a final round of interviews at McKinsey in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I finally, in that final round, I didn't make it. And I was super upset. And I actually didn't have plan B. I was so confident of getting in that I didn't have plan B. And I said, oh, now what? I haven't mm -hmm. applied for my master's in economics. I don't have any other job. So then I decided to come back to India. When I came back to India, I realized that just a BA in economics, even though if it was from the US and a top liberal arts college in the US was not sufficient. I reached mm -hmm. out to management consulting firms here. I reached out to some investment banks, having that background in econ and applied math. And I realized that, you know, an undergrad degree is not enough. What they value mm -hmm. is a master's degree. And so I was floating around thinking what I should do. And that's when I had a chance conversation with a family friend who introduced me to this whole world of advertising and marketing. And he did a pretty good sell job, I have to say. This is Sridhar, uh, right, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, Sridhar and big... Shumit, a combination of both Got of it. them. Got it. Got it. And uh, Shumit introduced me to Sridhar, who at that point in time was running Ogilvy Consulting, a brand consultancy mm. in Mumbai. He met me and he said, you know, Lulu, you have this right combination of the left brain and the right brain. I didn't really know what, I, what that meant, Deepak, to be honest, in those days. But he sold me to come be his right-hand person. I was his first employee on the ground in Mumbai. And it was the best year of my life. I fell in love with branding, fell in love with advertising, and then there was no looking back. Wow. Wow. Two, three, if I may share, right? Two, three things struck me. One is I've, I've come to realize sometimes people see us better than we see ourselves. You know, I go back to my journey when I was at McKinsey. And uh, when I came back from New Jersey to India, I was sort of exploring the typical post-McKinsey options like venture capital, private equity, et cetera. But one of my mentors looked at me and said, you seem to have a passion for the human side of things. Have you thought of executive search? So there's no way I could have arrived at that insight. So back to your point about what Sridhar said about the right brain, left brain. I've noticed that as we go through our journey, sometimes uh, uh, outside the way people see us, sometimes trumps insight the way we see ourselves. Um, lovely, lovely. Uh, and, and, and Deepak, sorry. Uh, you, uh, you have to be very lucky to have that. Mm. You know, some, of, mm. some of us have the gift of our parents giving that to us because mm. they've identified what our superpower is. Sometimes Correct. it's our bosses. But I have to say a lot of people go through life not knowing what their mm. inherent ability and talent is and then also aligning it with their career and mm. their life choices. So you're absolutely right. Having those people who are able to see that spark in you and mm. see that talent in you is very special. And it's something mm. that we have to be very grateful for. 
very true very true and and maybe just uh, uh, building on this i also noticed that sometimes these signals come as whispers and not in loudspeakers so we, we you talk about listening and sort of uh, reflection work and i think there's an element of how we process the signals as well which is as crucial but uh, I'll, I'll keep that in the parking lot and come back to it down the line <laughs> Um, I'm curious about uh, various professions and uh, what are the intrinsics required for a profession. Um, you know, one is sort of the surface level degree and qualifications, but I think every profession requires a certain trait, uh, which is helpful in that profession. So when you look at the field you're in, what would you say are the, uh, maybe the traits required to flourish uh, in this industry? So in brand consulting and design, we have brand strategists. Mm -hmm. We have the designers and then you have the client servicing folks who are the relationship builders. The underlying skill that all of these types of jobs requires is problem solving. Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, we are understanding the client's businesses. We are thinking about how best we solve those problems using brand. And therefore, for me, problem solving is the number one trait. But what does that then break down to? It breaks down to empathy, being able to truly get into the shoes of both our clients and their consumers or their customers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's super critical. Curiosity. Mm. At the end of the day, all our work is based on insights, so understanding mm. people, understanding the world, having this curious mindset of how things work is very important. Creativity, because we have to create lots and lots of solutions. It's the brainstorming, it's the ideation. Creativity is super important. Courage, because mm. we have to think different, right? Where the mm. best ideas, the best campaigns are very different because if you have to break out in the sea of sameness, you can't mm. be same, same. So you have to have mm. the courage to think differently, to present those bold ideas, to have conviction of mm. the ideas that you're bringing forward, to communicate very clearly, whether it's written in terms of a PowerPoint or a memo that you mm. have to prepare or articulate. A lot of times I see designers and strategists have great ideas, but even internally, they're not able to present those ideas mm. very crisply and get people behind those ideas. And then True. of course, it's a sales job. You know, yes. when we're in market, when we're an MBA, you remember people look down upon sales, but mm. actually Deepak, it's the thing I do day in and day and out. Where, and it's- That's where the rubber not, makes the road. That's where the exactly, rubber makes the road. Exactly, and it's, it's such a huge, uh, misnomer that sales mm. is is not that sexy but if you're good at sales you truly can actually go further faster in your career no matter which part of the organization you're at so those I would say are the underlying traits all mm. wrapped up in the service of problem solving mm. but then of course there's hunger that you have to bring to the table there's a certain energy and drive our uh, industry you work really hard, then mm. late nights, you need to have that stamina. And then, of course, passion, passion for brands, passion for people. I think mm. those are the, some of the traits that um, will help you set yourself apart. Lovely, lovely. And uh, congratulations on the journey and, you know, in terms of your evolution. And that's a separate conversation in itself. But uh, I want to sort of uh, come back to the book, Lulu, Go Further Faster. Um Give us a sense of why the book. Uh, and and also, you know, I'm curious about how people pick titles because in a way I'm sure a lot of thought goes into the design of the cover, design of the title. So give us a sense of how this book came into being and, uh, you know, just uh, how you've sort of chosen to present it on the cover. Sure. The short answer is that I wanted to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. The long answer is it started in 2015. The organizers of Z Melt, which is a mm -hmm. technology design marketing conference in Mumbai, had mm -hmm. reached out to me and said, hey, Lulu, we're having this conference coming up. We have a lot of workshops um, that will be offered while there are you know, main stage, side stages, et cetera. They were really packing the agenda with mm -hmm. lots of interesting things. 
and they threw me a curveball. They said, we want you to do a workshop on personal branding. Hmm. And I took a step back and I said, personal branding, what exactly do you mean? Then, of course, we had conversations and it led me to applying all of the principles of branding to think about hmm. if branding and what we do at Landor is help brands have enduring competitive advantage. That's what the role hmm. of you know, role of our, we think of ourselves as those who are enabling brands to have enduring competitive advantage. So I said, you know, that's really interesting. If we take this and apply it to human beings in the mm. workplace, might we use brand to give ourselves enduring competitive advantage, career insurance, and the ability to make those pivots? And so I started digging deeper. And then, of course, I came across Tom Peters' article from Fast Company in 1987 when he first talked about the brand called You. Hmm. And I started getting into this. A colleague and I developed a whole presentation around how you use the principles of branding to brand yourself mm -hmm. and what that would mean. And we did this workshop. And Deepak, mm -hmm. I have to tell you the experience of the workshop. So we were waiting for the workshop to start. It was a small, dingy room. Um, I think there was and only was space the, for about... And what was the profile of the audience, if I may? Yeah. Profile of the audience were younger people in marketing okay. and advertising, some Understood. clients, but mostly people from the industry, Understood. which typically happens in these conferences. And, and so we had, I think, seating room for about 30 people. My colleague mm -hmm. Gazala and I were excited, a little bit nervous. Because we'd done a lot of branding workshops, but we'd never done a personal branding workshop. And mm -hmm. Deepak, literally 10 minutes before the presentation was to start, the workshop was to start, there were hardly anybody there. There was like maybe one or two people there. And I really started getting nervous. I said, oh my God, my reputation is going to tank. Imagine if somebody walks by, sees this workshop in action and sees, you know, one and a half, two people in the room. Oh, I'm going to be sunk. But then I was very busy engaging the couple of people who mm. were in the workshop, getting to know them. And then when I suddenly looked up, the room was full. And then the organizers were opening the doors and creating space for more people to come in. We ended up having 30 people sitting, about 20 people standing. People were standing outside looking in. I was like, okay, wow, there is some traction. To cut a long story short, Deepak, at the end of the workshop, the message that we were sharing around how you can use positioning, purpose, mm. personality, a very deliberate attempt mm. of packaging the value that you bring to the workplace and then signaling it everywhere. Mm. That message resonated very strongly. A lot of people came up to me. We actually started a WhatsApp group, which we still have from that workshop. Wow. And we called it Born on the Boat because the Lando story is very powerful. And when I told the Lando story of how Lando was born on a boat, a couple mm -hmm. of people said, okay, we're going to call this WhatsApp group Born on a Boat and we're going to talk about personal branding. And so after that, Deepak, I got started getting invitations. You know how it works on Google. Yeah. They search your name. They see that you did this workshop at Zmail 2015. Mm -hmm. And then somebody mm -hmm. else says, oh, can you do a personal branding workshop? And that's mm. how my so-called expertise in personal branding developed by doing it again and again and again. And then a couple of years later, I said, you know, I need to be the best example of this. Otherwise, mm. people will say, what's your credibility, Lulu, other than working at Lando and working on large corporate brands and consumer brands? Mm. And so mm. I decided to make myself a case study. And then lots of people, Deepak, kept coming to me and saying, how do we do this? And mm. having a job at Lando, I couldn't obviously take on personal sure. branding for everyone. So I said, okay, I'm going to distill all of my learnings and I'm going to do it via book. So then I went and met uh, somebody who is an SPGen alum, mm -hmm. IG, Indrajit Gupta, who yeah, is a yeah, former he's a, he's a good friend as editor. Well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, former editor for India. Founding yes. Fuel, exactly. I'm a huge fan of his work. I yes. met IG and I said, IG, I want to write a book. I couldn't think of someone better than you to guide me. 
And he said, you know, Lulu, a book is a bit old fashioned. You should mm. think of how to develop a digital community. Mm. That was all he said to me. Then I went back and thought about it. And I said, you know, I also need to build my website, luluragavan.com. Mm. Because mm -hmm. in all my workshops, I was talking about how your website is such an mm. important signaling of who you are. You have control of the assets. You have control mm. over the message. And so the combination of the chat with IG, the fact that I needed to quickly put my website together, then led me to saying that I don't want this website of mine to be a glorification of just mm. who I am and all my credentials. How might I create value for mm. others? That's when I came up with the idea of doing a newsletter, a weekly mm. newsletter. And then, of course, it was around what should this newsletter be? I couldn't talk about personal branding week after week after week. And then I also wanted to address something else where a lot of people mistakenly think that personal branding is very cosmetic. It's mm. all about just shouting out from the rooftop. It uh, is quite crass and it doesn't have any substance, but actually it couldn't be further than the truth. Mm. You have to have a foundation of solidity, of credibility, of contribution, and then, of course, is the visibility and the showcasing, which is important. And it was quite a complicated message to mm. uh, very crisply send out. So I said, OK, I'm going to focus my newsletter on helping people develop themselves holistically. Mm. Each week, I'm going to share one idea, uh, which is why the newsletter is ideas to play with. So it could be emotional intelligence. It could be uh, being a mentor. It could be how to receive and give feedback I'm a, and so, i'm one of the beneficiaries uh, happy oh, beneficiaries yes. oh that's so sweet and Absolutely. so that's how it all started and then one of my friends said lulu everyone is writing a book you've got to do mm. it mm. otherwise it's going to be too late why don't you distill all of your learnings from the newsletter i thought that might be a little boring just to do mm. a compilation of the newsletter i didn't think mm. it was very valuable so then she introduced me to a book coach, a coach for writing, actually. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I met Chinmay Manjanath, who then encouraged me to write a concept for my book. Mm -hmm. Me being me, rather than writing a memo, I said, I'm going to do a nice presentation. It's going mm -hmm. to be visual. And so actually, Deepak dug into all of the tools of design thinking, and I created mm -hmm. a prototype which mm -hmm. isn't actually far from what you're seeing today, wow. where I said, you know, what if I wrote a book which was talking to the 21-year-old me? I wish it were mm -hmm. the book that my parents had gifted me when I was starting out in the world of work. I wish I knew all of these things mm -hmm. so that I could equip myself so well that I could accelerate my career and literally go further faster. And so that whole thought process of the prototype, of having a headline, having a subtext to explain mm. that headline, actually doing a chapter outline. I even did mock um, endorsements of mm -hmm. what people might say. And that prototype, when I showed it to Chinmay, she loved it. She's like, this is great. Mm. I love the structure, the three parts of the book and the handy how-tos. And she said, let's start reaching out to publishers. And that was the start of the journey. Wow. The yeah, outstanding. And maybe if I may come in, uh, you know, as I said, I've, I've derived a lot of value from your newsletters. And the one thing that sort of stood out for me in the book was that there's a lot of uh, sharing. You know, newsletter, I felt, was a lot of uh, ideas and provoking reflection. But when I read the book, I felt I could I, I could understand. For example, uh, you, you may not know what connects with people, right? Some of my childhood was spent in Madurai. So oh, I, no, I, really? Wow. Yeah, my <laughs> my maternal grandmother was in Madurai in a place called uh, Tirunagar. So a lot of my childhood was in that home, playing with my cousins, etc. So when I read that, and, and you talk about Vishnu Sahasranamam as a way of you know, calming yourself down. So it's it's fascinating what uh, different, when you, when you put out a little bit about yourself, you know, the different things that stick. So, so we'll, we'll explore some of this, but I'm glad, I'm glad uh, you went down the path of distilling, uh, distilling the wisdom. Uh, coming back uh, to the other question uh, I was curious about, uh, do you want to spend a couple of minutes talking about maybe the cover and the title? 
Sure. Um, I'm a huge believer in the headline. You know, mm. brand ideas are about <clears throat> crisply encapsulating what the brand stands for. And Go Further Faster was essentially a call to action to everyone. Initially, I had young women in mind because mm. those were the women that I was mentoring to say that, you know, you really can be ambitious and think big. Mm. And I'm going to give you all of the tools to help you advance in your career. Now, this faster is tricky because when I put this out on LinkedIn, Mm. People thought maybe it's quick tricks and hacks. Mm. Mm. And I think it sent the wrong connotation to some people. But what mm. I meant was that things take time. You know, I'm a huge mm. fan of the compounding interest. And whether it's learning or how you show up at work, your presence, or how you interact with others. All of these things take time to develop if you know they are important. And so my whole thesis is when you're young, when you know these things, you actually can move much faster up mm. the ranks or sideways or whatever it is in your career. And secondly, it's not just Deepak about Zooming. Mm. It's about purpose and making a difference having a legacy, which is why the tagline is shaping a life that matters. And so I don't want it to be unidimensional. So that's the title, Go Further, Comma Faster. Hopefully it evokes something in your mind. It's not a descriptive title. It's something that's quite mm. suggestive. It, many people can read many things, right? I like that it was very active, the go. The mm. further was all about the reach, play to mm. potential is mm -hmm. go as much as you can. And that comma faster was really to say, hey, you know what, when you have that knowledge, mm. that knowledge can propel you. Now coming to the cover of the book, I engaged with uh, a designer, a very talented designer that I've worked with. A lot of people were very keen to design my book and mm -hmm. it was hard to make a decision, but it was an emotional de decision. She's a friend as well. But it's also a little bit hard when you work with a friend, right? You can't say, I don't like anything. But mm. she's very talented and that wasn't the case. So my friend uh, and colleague, former colleague, Pavitra, read the draft of the book and mm. came up with 10, 12 amazing ideas for what the cover should be. And when I saw this particular one, for me, it was love at first sight mm. because she had tapped into my color which is yellow I've been so associated with right. yellow over the years right. my if you remember my newsletter yes. my website there's so much of yellow yellow is my color but she brought in this um, vibrancy and energy to the cover with the color combination which is very very striking and then I love the prism that mm. when you look at the back of the book as well, you'll see that it's quite interesting the way it's laid out. To me, it was a metaphor for all of the things that you do, all of the knowledge and uh, skills that you collect, which then start to come together to take you interesting. forward. Interesting. So it's, it's a bit abstract. Not everybody will see it. You might see an arrow. You might see... A lot of that uh, preparation, which is then required for you to have that focus to take you forward. But overall, I just love the color combination, the way the typography and the way in which everything was laid out. And it was hard, though, Deepak, because my daughters and my husband like some other options. You then have to convince Bloomsbury. Mm. They had their heart set on another one. Hmm. And so it was a lot of going back to sales, talking about why this cover, this color combination was right for my book, given my brand. But it finally all came together. And I hope you like it. I hope it's lovely. it resonates. It's lovely. I think if I may 
the story that comes to mind, I think it's attributed to either George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, I forget, when he was asked to cut a tree in six days and given an ax, you know, he spent five days sharpening the ax and the sixth day cutting the tree. So this, this to me, feels a bit like, you know, you, oh, you nice. do all the work to sharpen the ax and then you cut the tree in a day. But then, you know, very often we just start cutting without being thoughtful about the various facets where oh i love that deepak i love that i'm going to quote you <laughs> when somebody asks me no what is this about i'll say this is what i thought and here are some of the other things that people saw in the cover design and i'm glad i asked the question i think going back to one of the things you said earlier you know when you started that presentation about personal branding with two people in the room and finishing with a crowded room I, I think I've, uh, if I may, I've also I've been a late uh, believer in the power of compounding. You know, even if I go back to the journey of the podcast six, seven years back, we would track the clicks. There'd be some 20 clicks for the first episode, you know, 35. And after six, seven years, you know, it's sort of slowly built into something meaningful. But uh, sometimes we sort of get disillusioned with the two that we start with and then give up. So I think... Uh, uh, strongly, strongly resonate with the with the point you made about compounding. Um, Absolutely, and there's that old Chinese proverb story about the bamboo tree, right? When you mm. plant a bamboo tree, the the roots are taking a hold, Maybe long but you time. can't see like, it for a long time, and suddenly it blooms. You know, it's been like that for me in my career as well, mm. where people suddenly think that. What hey, Lulu's an overnight success, but it's actually not an overnight success. It's been 23 years in the making. People don't see what's underneath. So you're absolutely right. And since you mentioned it, if I may uh, sort of understand that a little bit, what I'm curious about again is sort of having, uh, I'm curious about how people navigate that valley. Uh, if I may, uh, disillusionment is a wrong term, but there's a phase where you're sort of slogging in the dark with the hope that something will come out of it. But the recognition or the feedback comes much later. So what keeps you going in the interim? People have asked me this question so much because I was managing director of India for 15 years. Hmm. People say, aren't you bored? Aren't you uh, going to go to another company? But Deepak, I so loved what I was doing. I felt valued in the workplace. I felt mm. that my work made a difference. And it just gave me that inspiration to wake up, to have that energy to come to work every day. And I didn't at that point in time, like you really understand how compound interest worked. But I did know that I was at a company that was giving me opportunities. And while there were many, many lows, I had to keep my head down to keep showing up hmm. and make the most of every day. And who knows, every day was a new day. And luckily, I was not so fussed about titles hmm. uh, and salary. Yes, it was important. It still is important. But I had kids. Uh, I had young children. I had so many different priorities. I was very mm. thankful for a job that was uh, that gave me flexibility. And I think it put things in perspective when mm. as a working woman, you're raising children, you have parents to look after as well. You do have a career. You don't become unidimensional and only think career, career, career. And so True. you're more grateful for what you have. And it could be that that allowed me to, mm. you know, get through those 10, 10, 12 years of, of showing up every day and building expertise without a change in role. Mm. The our organization was growing. You know, I started Lando in India and it went from zero to five, to 10 to 25, and then 70, 150, 200, right? So there were challenges at every step of the way, but I go back to being extremely get, grateful for working at a company where I feel like what I do makes a difference. I have a lot of autonomy and mm. I feel very valued. And actually my uncle, RG, who you also mm -hmm. know, I've had a few career chats with him because mm -hmm. I would always feel some anxiety that I was in the same place mm. and not jumping around or getting to the next thing or the next thing. And he gave me some very sage advice. RG said to me, 
Are you feeling motivated? Are you feeling like you have meaty challenges? Are you growing every day? That's mm. the question that you need to ask yourself. You don't need to justify to anybody else, Lulu. If you mm. answer those questions for yourself and you feel like you're growing every day, you're motivated, you have that sense of purpose and you're showing up at work with lots of energy and lots of passion, forget about everybody else and follow your own path. Mm. And that gave me that confidence and a little bit of validation. We all require validation Absolutely. that I'm on the right path. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and another piece of advice, I he, he was kind enough to make time for the podcast I run. And one of the uh, phrases he uses is refire, don't retire. You know, so it's, nice. it's very, very often people see it as a very binary choice. You know, I'll quit this and do something else. But sometimes within the same canvas, it's a, it, we have an opportunity to refire, find a new, something new to keep us going. For example, this book is a is a refiring opportunity the way I see to sort of take this to the next level and so on. Um, I think uh, just uh, maybe reflecting on the other point you made as well, I find in the work I do, uh, when people have multiple identities that they cultivate beyond the work identity, I find that they often have the resilience to plow through. You know, you spoke about being a mother, being a daughter and so on. Um, you know, I, I find that very often when you have all your eggs in one basket, which is the professional identity and things don't, you don't see the outcomes and then suddenly you start getting restless, you start doing funny things and then, you know, a cascade uh, plays out. But it's interesting you're talking about the link between the, if I may say, the multidimensionality of life and the resilience to plow through uh, going back to the same Yeah, actually, even one of your podcasts, Hermina Ibarra, Ibarra uh, I think one of those, uh, when I was listening to her podcast, there was a lot about identity Yes. Uh, yes. at work. And so it's a useful one. Maybe I should go back and listen to it because you make an excellent point around this multidimensionality, having these passion projects or side yes. hustles. And yes. some people would say that refires you and hmm. keeps you going. So Absolutely. that's an excellent point. And on how, that do you, note, how do you hmm. purposefully actively pursue these Yes. To keep yourself energized. Correct. And each identity is actually a plant that grows into a tree, right? You start something and over time, it becomes an identity. So her book, Working Identity, is arguably the book I've quoted the most in my conversations. It's, it's profoundly shaped uh, my journey. So it's, 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 it's I should a write that piece. down. Yes. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Going back to your book, uh, Lulu, uh, you know, uh, one of the things you talk about, I think you uh, refer to a conversation with Shumit Roy, uh, one of the two mentors you spoke about, or one of the many mentors, uh, small fish in a big pond or big fish in a small pond. You know, I've I've grappled with it at different points. Uh, what's What's been your lived experience about how people should uh, uh, make this choice at various points in their journey? So Shumit was the one who I had that conversation with when I came back from Davidson with a degree mm. in economics and math, and I was looking for jobs. He asked me lots of questions about myself, about my personality, about these different passions that I had and had led me to Sridhar at Ogilvy mm -hmm. by telling me that I really should think hard of whether I wanted to be a small fish in a mm. big pond or a big fish in a small pond, small pond. And you know, Deepak actually is very interesting that big fish in a small pond is another way of saying go further faster. Mm -hmm. It is about strategically positioning mm. yourself mm. in a smaller setting. Mm. Uh, so that your contributions are more visible and you can truly mm. maximize your potential. At least mm. that's the way I think about it. So what might that mean for somebody who's contemplating this idea of being a big fish in a small pond? It is about perhaps choosing a smaller company. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is a smaller business unit in mm. a large company. Mm -hmm where it's not the sea of sameness and hundreds of people doing the same thing and you're just another cog in the wheel. It is the ability to develop some specialized expertise. So for, if I take my own example, 
I did branding and design consulting, not advertising. I would have just been one of thousands of people in advertising. Mm. But choosing branding and design consulting versus advertising for me was that career choice. Mm. Then thinking about develop specialized expertise. So again, it was mm. brand strategy. It was naming. I've mm. named so many organizations and brands, you know, developing that specialized expertise. To be a big fish in a small pond, you also have to have influence mm. and therefore building relationships internally and externally. Mm. I've written about this in my book as well. How do you go about it very strategically? It's taking on leadership roles, not being afraid, so putting yourself out there mm. to maximize those opportunities. Of course, it is about delivering that high performance day in and day out so mm. that in a smaller setting, you're noticed and you rise faster mm. and mm. then of course it's leveraging visibility in that environment to create this outsized influence mm. Mm. got it for me, me that's what big fish in a small pond is about and actually it's everything that i've written about in my book and i'm super grateful for shumit and sridhar for having given me this nudge had i been an investment banker or a management consultant i don't think i would be who mm. i am today that's true. That's true. And I think the more we think about the careers of the future, I guess there are so many, uh, if I may say, micro combinations that people can pick and really figure out a skill stack which makes them distinctive in the playground that they choose to craft. Uh, you know, one of the guests on my podcast uh, was uh, Rama Bijapurkar, uh, the consumer behavior expert. And one of the things she Love said was... Love Rama. Have huge respect for her. Same here. And one of the things she said was sometimes we need to be more intentful about figuring out the playground where we want to compete than mastering the game, having figured out the playground. Very often you get, you, you want to play cricket, you get cricket coaching. You want to play TT, you get TT coaching. But figuring out the sport actually is a meta question that sometimes we're not that thoughtful about. So back to your point about big fish, small pond. I think there's this meta question about figuring out the playground and the skill stack that we want to bring to that playground, which is a, which is, such a powerful determinant of outcomes. And actually early in your career, that could be something super valuable, where to play, how to win. Mm. And I don't think we're all so strategic about our career. We're just desperate to get a job at a Microsoft, an Apple, a Tata, you know, one of those storied brands. But hopefully the young people today who are super smart are thinking much more strategically about the industries and uh, careers that they choose. Very true, very true. And you're, you're touching upon something that's very close to my heart, where to play, how to win, actually maps to where to go and how to grow. And people spend <laughs> much more time. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd pick up on that. I've heard it in your podcast so many Correct. times. You, you branded you yourself spent. really well, I must say. Oh, thank you. Coming from someone like you, it means a lot. I think the, the point I wanted to say was the people spend too much time thinking about the how to grow, but the where to go actually is a more strategic choice. Uh, and, and to your point, uh, it's, it's lovely how you've sort of uh, picked a niche and uh, sort of cultivated it over time. And, and moving to another theme that I was uh, struck by in the book, uh, Lulu, you talk about uh, a mind-body-soul approach for flourishing in the workplace. Uh, you know, in the workplace, especially, I've, I've heard enough people talking about the role of the mind and the body, but soul is often seen as something that you don't bring to work. You sort of, it sort of feels woo-woo. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what you mean by soul uh, and how we can bring that to the workplace. It used to be woo-woo. I think no longer so because authenticity, vulnerability, mm -hmm. All of these have become absolutely critical, especially post-COVID, in mm. terms of how leaders have to deal with people. But going back to your question, I'm a huge wellness fan. And so mm. I've always been fascinated by a holistic approach to wellness. And from there, I actually got this concept of how even professional growth cannot just be one or two dimensions. It has to be holistic. And as you said, mm -hmm. mind is fairly easy to figure out. There's a lot of talk right now on body as well. Health has become such a huge priority. The soul part of it, to me, is that inner essence of yourself. 
-hmm. It's the emotions that you tap into to create positive advantage for yourself in the workplace. It's also regulating, managing your emotions. It's all the soft things. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I write about things like gratitude and mm -hmm. how that helps you. I write mm. about empathy, about emotional intelligence, about cultivating relationships. It's all the softer skills mm. Mm. which aren't taught as much, but they're also those that are so close to your heart. And mm. I truly believe that showing up as your full self is the only mm. way to play to potential. And therefore, I felt that writing about soul quite specifically in the book and having all of these different dimensions of it. And I've only covered a few. There are sure. so many more dimensions of how you tap into that inner essence hmm. and how do you bring that so that you create differentiation for yourself as well, because you're authentic and you're living life, not based on what somebody else says you should be, but true to yourself. That's where soul comes from. A lot of early readers of the book have said that that's super fascinating. In fact, Pavitra, who did my cover design, she's a voracious reader. And mm -hmm. I was a bit nervous, honestly, giving her the draft of the book. I thought she would be like, there's nothing new that I learned, Lulu. But she mm -hmm. loved the soul session section. Mm. And she felt that there were so many parts in there that she reflected on. So it's that... It's the softer side, it's the emotions, it's tapping into that inner essence of you. Hmm. And actually, another related theme that you talk about in the book, which which uh, uh, got me to pause and think, uh, was you talk about how we all could potentially read a psychologically rich life. You know, uh, I thought, again, it was, a, it was a phrase that stayed with me and I marinated in it. Can you talk a little bit about what you have in mind when you say a psychologically rich uh, in, in the context of the lives we lead? Yeah. And uh, so Deepak, when I was doing my newsletter, I came across this concept and it truly is going back to what we were talking about emotions. It's engaging with the full spectrum of mm. your emotions, positive mm. and negative. And you do that by consciously living life. So mm. experiences. So whether that's travel or the arts where you go watch drama, watch a movie, mm. you read a book, you go out mm. with friends, you take yourself out of your cocoon, of your ivory tower, you go out there and you engage. You mm. engage with people, you engage with places, you engage with ideas. And when you think about living life, very often there's the happy life, which is quite a mm. hedonistic life. It's you work mm. hard, you play hard. I'm not making a judgment on that, but that's the happy life. And then you have mm -hmm. the other extreme, which is a very meaningful life, mm -hmm. a life of service. It's mm -hmm. very sincere. It's pur pur very purposeful and mm -hmm. it has a lot of meaning. But psychological richness is making sure that you're curating how you spend your time to have all of these experiences. So having this these rich range of experiences because it feeds your soul. Hmm. it makes you self-aware and um, therefore I'm a huge fan of it I believe that it's the only way to live it gives you hmm. energy it, being in the creative profession it fuels my creativity it helps hmm. me think expansively hmm. and it gives you that excitement to wake up every day Absolutely. you can never be depressed when you lead, leave, lead a psychologically rich life, because there's always something when you step out of yourself hmm. and experience something else, it's going to charge you up. Many, yeah, absolutely. It, it stayed with me and uh, something I will, I will be a lot more deliberate about as we, as we move through. Um, and I think that of the various things you talk about, one thing that's personally uh, helped me is just the role of art, you know, for us in our home. There's music, three of us learn an instrument, my wife and the kids learn Bharatanatyam. So I think somehow, especially during COVID, uh, since you mentioned, it sort of helped us keep our sanity as we went through life. So I think sometimes I notice, um, you know, in all our education, we train the brain, but we don't train the heart enough. And I find uh, art and many of the things you talk about in the book uh, are wonderful pathways to psychological richness. So, so thank you. Uh, the other piece I wanted to pick up on, um, 
was on journaling. You know, you talk about some of your habits and 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 in my conversations as well with leaders uh, in the podcast and through the other work I do, if there's one sort of common theme that comes up is I think it's just having the space for reflection and uh, very often journaling. Talk to talk to us about um, the role it's played in your life and and maybe you, some of the rituals around journaling you have. So many years ago, I came across this uh, famous writer called Anne Lamott. Mm -hmm. Anne Lamott wrote a book called uh, Bird by Bird, and it's considered one of the authorities, a very authoritative book on how to write well. Mm -hmm. And in that book, Deepak, Anne talks about forensically excavating your childhood wow. and writing about it. And so I started doing that. And I realized when I was thinking, I literally would go back to from my first memory was probably three or four from photos. I didn't really, mm. really remember. I, was, you know, I would sit and think about my childhood. And so much of this book is from Anne Lamott's, mm. um, you know, call to action to say, hey, spend a lot of time to write, write vividly about your childhood, about your fifth birthday party and the first mm. gift that you got and your first day at school. And I did all of that. And I realized, Deepak, that, gosh, I've been a writer. I've been a writer for so long. I then realized that I think from fifth standard, I had diaries that I was writing every night. Uh, when I went to France, I spent six months there. I would write in French every night at the end of the day. And then in the last five, seven, ten years in the world of work, I just stopped mm. doing that. Hmm. And so when I started reflecting, writing about my childhood, I said, you know what? I need to bring back writing into my life. And this was also COVID. So much of my learnings of the book have been in the last four or five years. And I had a counselor who I'd reached out to because I was struggling. And she actually said, journaling is hugely helpful. And she hmm. gave me guidance on journaling, but to start with gratitude mm -hmm. so what are 10 things that you're grateful for and you do that every day that's how wow. I got back into journaling you won't believe how it changed absolutely changed my mindset and my mood by doing this consistently for six months I was in the brink of collapse of a relationship I was able to bring that back and it really helped me in many ways at the same time I was also following Todd Henry who is one mm -hmm. of my favorite authors. He's written many, many books. And Todd also talks about how all of us as knowledge professionals, we are taking in so much mm. information. We're so greedy about the best podcasts and the best mm. books, but actually they're all quite useless mm. if we don't spend the time to capture, to write what we've learned, to mm. organize it. And then of course, a practice of, silence or mm. walking or meditation or yoga so that all those dots in your brain actually can connect now I mm. know I'm talking much more than journaling but for mm. me journaling was about gratitude it was about also writing I, I have a mm. journal for ideas so mm -hmm. I write down like after I write a podcast I listen to a podcast even your podcast sometimes when I'm on the road deeper I actually stop by the road I open my notes on my phone and I write down a few things that uh, have you. really stood out for me in a conversation. I have lots of those notes. And then there's the third one. So I also discovered Julia Cameron's Morning Pages. So Julia mm -hmm. Cameron um, introduced Morning Pages about 30, 40 years ago and is credited with having created so many geniuses who, because of this practice, wrote these most amazing books. Elizabeth Gilbert, a famous author also credits Julia Cameron for mm -hmm. uh, helping her creativity flourish. And what Morning Pages is, is a very simple formula. As soon as you wake up within the first five or 10 minutes of finishing your morning rituals, take a notebook and write three pages. You can never read it again. Wow. You don't have judgment. You just write what's in your head. It could be frustration it could be mm -hmm. hope it could be love it could be anything but you mm -hmm. just have to write and you have to write three pages every day 
And when you do that day in and day out, what does it do? For me, I found that it regulates my emotions because a lot mm. of, lots of random stuff comes out and you're just writing it. So it helps me mentally prepare for the day because whatever's in my head, I've now put it on paper and usually it then leaves my mm. mind, right? So it gives me that mental preparedness. It regulates my emotions. And over time, I felt that that daily practice of morning pages made it so easy for me to write my newsletter every week. Mm. And frankly, the book, everyone asks me, how do you write the book in spite of a busy job and all of that? You know, Deepak, on weekends, I would sit down to write and I would use the Pomodoro technique, 25 minutes. Mm. I would not move until I typed it out. And I had, because I had so much in my mind, I had done morning pages. I could write thousand words in 25 minutes and I would surprise mm. myself, like, you know, tapping it out. And slowly, slowly, slowly over nine months, my book happened. It wasn't, you know, being locked away for long periods of time. It was just consistently finding those gaps to do it. But writing, journaling is, mm. did all of this for me. So I'm using journaling more broadly to, to have uh, gratitude, to capture mm. what you're learning as well as to empty the monkey mind of Mm. um, what's in there. And you have to to clear it to give you that clarity. And it works in a very magical way. And Mm. if you read, uh, if you go on Google and search morning pages and read the stories that people have told about Mm -hmm. morning pages and what it did for them, suddenly the book happened, right? And you, you, you you cannot have a logical explanation mm. of how morning pages works i can mm. just say i'm a huge fan and there are lots of other endorsers famous endorsers of it as well so everyone listening to your podcast should go on google and search morning pages by julia cameron and mm-hmm. do it i hugely endorse it and absolutely I, I was talking to another person uh, and and this came up you're, just, you're the second person to talk about it so i'll uh, I'll definitely look it up. And, and I completely agree with you. These things are so nonlinear. It's hard when you do these things to see the cause and effect. But sometimes, uh, you know, to your point about connecting, sort of creating the space for connecting the dots. Very often we don't create the space. So I can imagine uh, activities like these, uh, journaling, morning pages, uh, can can make a huge difference. Lulu, picking up on one of the other things you talk about in the book, I think there are two, three instances where you talk about a particular passage of play where you were booted out of a project in London. And in a way, you know, that's sort of shaking uh, quite a bit, uh, shaking you up quite a bit and how you rebounded after that. So talk to us a little bit about that passage of play. And I think all of us in our journeys, it's, it's never a straight line, right? I think we have our speed bumps. So I'd love, I'd love for you to expand on just that, uh, that phase uh, where you were booted out and talk to us about how you came back. Gosh, Deepak, I should try not to get into that mode because it was the lowest of lows in my mm-hmm. career. It was 2006. I had mm-hmm. moved to London. I had moved from brand strategy and naming into client management because my mentor then had advised me to be successful at Lando. You need to be a rainmaker. You need to be the one bringing in those relationships and cultivating those relationships. So I went quite outside my comfort zone and moved into client management. So I was client director. I was staffed on a very, very exciting project, which was the rebranding of Jet Airways. Wow. How prestigious is that to be in London, to be at Landor, to be working on the rebranding of Jet Airways, to work directly with Mr. Goyal and his Mm -hmm. team. Super, super exciting. Put my heart and soul into it. Three months into the project, I came to Bangalore for my cousin brother's wedding. I'd taken a week or 10 days off. And then went back to London. I was no longer on the project. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I asked for reasons. Those were not given to me very clearly. I was wondering, is it because I'm Indian and the client doesn't really want an Indian who's holding it all together? I wasn't the lead. There were many more senior senior people. I was Mm -hmm. still mid-career at that point in time. But I still remember being pulled into the MD's office 
she mm. and the senior director on the uh, who was leading the client said that they were changing up the staffing on it and i literally started crying i wasn't begging to be on it but i was i just couldn't understand what was happening i it's, i don't think i've cried before or after that that was the only incident of crying at the workplace but it was embarrassing because it was two senior people they didn't know what to do with me mm. and the md just said okay well why don't you collect yourself collect your thoughts and we can speak later mm. it was very hard for me for two or three months i would choke every day because i was not on this project i wasn't flying to india anymore i told all my friends that i was on jet airways i was mm. doing the rebranding of it i was watching from the sidelines and i lost that spring in my step that desire to go to work every day to i had a one hour train journey by uh, tube journey in london it was such a schlep i was so annoyed every morning i've never felt like that before or since but you know L- london weather down, doesn't help with these situations yeah london well. <laughs> weather doesn't help at all absolutely not right <laughs> um but i just threw myself into other projects um i was very lucky that one of the other senior leaders took me under his wing i started doing new business with him i was on his projects and slowly 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 i just said mm. i got to get over this it was like a bad breakup where you keep thinking mm. about it uh mm. you feel what could you have done differently you know there was no closure because i wasn't given a proper excuse whether mm. was it my competence was it my personality was it something else not mm. having that closure is really difficult um but then i can share with you that i got pregnant and so i got distracted as well in terms of my priorities and i would show up at work with this other director and do everything for him mm. and slowly 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 i just learned to numb the pain Mm. and focus on creating value somewhere else i also realized deepak that people maybe perhaps didn't understand that the value i was bringing the hard work that i was doing and a lot of people at the workplace especially women mm. find that they work so hard they selflessly giving of their time their talent and their energy to companies who may not appreciate it not value it and things like what happened to me may ha- be happening on a regular basis to them mm. and that's when i started thinking about it wasn't called personal branding then mm. but that i really needed to be clear on my superpower and what people should think that they can get from me and mm. what projects kind of projects that they should put me on so while it was a low i think it taught me a lot it also mm. gave me that resilience Mm. and until then i didn't have a low in my career really and so it was important to have that shake up beyond that hey you know what you're not uh mm. you know you're not at the top of your game or you're not as amazing as you think you are it was a real good grounding mm. and uh, it made me humble it wasn't like i was arrogant but i think it mm. reminded me that you know you're not floating mm. and this this can happen to you any times so you have to always be on top of your game hmm it's so true lulu and i think uh, it reminded me when i read that uh, story it reminded me of an instance in mckinsey where i was working on a project we were slogging till midnight 1 am for some reason the client wasn't seeing value um, and we got to know that the project had been paused we said okay fair enough it happens all the time and then 3 weeks later we got to know that the project has been started by the client with a different team you know yeah. so basically if you connect the dots we realized that something was wrong and and at that stage i remember going through a lot of uh, personal if i may say beating up uh, myself but one of my mentors took me aside and said there are just so many variables at play here so so this is you know just don't over analyze it and just show up the next day and move on so to your point sometimes what i've also noticed is just uh, moving on and just showing up and then slowly and no no easy answers here but uh, not uh, being fatalistic about these things can can make such a big difference um uh the other piece i guess uh, going back to where you started on this journey lulu is personal branding right you talk about very often 
when I hear people talk about personal branding, it's all fluffy stuff. But you sort of break it down into five Ds. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what each of these are. And I think uh, given that it's sort of overused these days, I think it'll be good to also spend a little bit of time on how it's been misunderstood by a few. I think what not to do, I think, is as important as what to do. So maybe if you want to start with just laying out the various Ds, and then we can we can get into you know some of the mistakes people make. Yeah, it actually started with um, the three acts of personal branding. I said act one, act two, and act three, mm -hmm. where it was about defining who you are, the special mm -hmm. value that you bring to the table, mm -hmm. designing it, and then delivering it. That was a very simple mm -hmm. um, way of thinking about it. But then when I was writing the book and I also had to do a two week uh, course on personal branding for second year students at Bitsome, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ranjan Banerjee, who was the, uh, the dean then invited me to do this. It really forced me to think much more rigorously about a robust framework. Mm -hmm. And that's when I leaned into the design thinking methodology and what we use in branding and design firms and certainly what we use at Mando in terms of how we uh, approach our projects. And I applied that to create five Ds of mm -hmm. personal branding. So the first is discover, where you mm -hmm. discover yourself. You have to go in before you go out. It's mm -hmm. about self-awareness, self-understanding, and truly honing in on your strengths that you can amplify mm. in your branding. So you discover all of those traits and attributes that make you you. What makes Deepak Jairaman so special? And I What's love the phrase you used a little earlier, uh, forensic excavation, right? Very often we don't mind who we are. So that's such a powerful term to be used in the discovery process uh, in terms of who And that's are. one of the mistakes uh, mm. We'll come to that. But um, mm. so the first D is discover. Mm. Then you have to define your brand. There mm. are many ways of doing it. You know, Unilever has the brand key. At Lando, mm. we have the brand driver platforms. So I looked at all of these tools mm -hmm. and then I distilled it to three very simple things. Defining your purpose, mm -hmm. figuring out your positioning. Mm -hmm. In your field, relative to others, what is the thing that only you do really, really well? And then mm -hmm. your personality, because mm -hmm. it's those two or three phrases that then mm -hmm. make up your personal brand. So discover. Mm -hmm. The second D is design. Mm -hmm. Then we have, uh, sorry, discover, define. The yes. third D is design, where you have to think about how you intentionally show up based mm. on how you've defined your brand. So this could be everything from how you speak, how mm. you shake your hand, uh, how you show up, what's the energy that you exude or not when you're mm. in a room, mm. what uh, your website or your social media says, even how you comment on LinkedIn. All mm. of these are elements that you can intentionally design. Then, of course, you use all of these tools to uh, deploy your personal mm -hmm. brand. And I talk about uh, deployment in terms of a website, social media, maybe even an ebook, conferences, etc. Right. How do you go about that? And then finally, it is about delivering it day in and day out. It's the delivery mm -hmm. where you have clarity of who you are, you have consistency in the way that you show up, and you have commitment for a long period of time. Deepak, your podcast has reached here after six, seven years, as you rightly said, of having clarity of the message, of having that consistency of how you conduct the podcast, the themes that you pull out, you. and having that commitment in the long term. So that's the five Ds. So it is um, discover, define, design, deploy, and deliver. Fascinating. And and maybe just building on it, um, what are the mistakes you see people make? Which are the steps they miss or which are the steps they misunderstand very often if you had to sort of look at the commonly made mistakes? 
one of the most common mistakes is when people say i need to have a personal brand let me put myself out there let me go mm. on linkedin let me go on instagram uh maybe i write an article or two it's execution and mm. tactics before the strategy mm. Mm. and as i've pointed out even before strategy the self discovery mm. so i think people are starting at the wrong end and i mm. see this especially with young people i see it also with older people like ceos who just want articles and thought mm. leadership and believe that that's personal branding mm. that's one common mistake where they go out before they go in and they mm. don't do that thinking and strategy that's the strategy first you be a consultant you know that but you need to have a plan and a strategy before you execute that's a common mistake the second mistake is people think my work will speak for itself hmm talking about my work is crass but there's a way to do it hmm. and in fact google has taken on this amazing initiative called hashtag i am remarkable and it encourages and inspires women especially women minorities and anyone who engages with the content to truly believe in their inherent worth and to talk about it and to celebrate their successes having said that a common mistake that i see especially on linkedin is that there's too much focus on just i me myself my mm. awards all the great things that have happened that is important and it's a fine balance but i think you have to think about what's the value you're delivering mm. to the community Hmm. So for me I think about always inspiring with branding and design news any commentary on branding and design I talk about women in leadership and then that's sprinkled with achievements of Lando our awards etc hmm. achievements of myself it's a combination of that but I think striking that balance of just promoting yourself too much True. versus actually hmm. adding value to your audience is uh an important one and then i think another mistake is people just think that it's a waste of time it doesn't have value mm. but actually it couldn't be further from the truth not having a personal brand is like careening out of control i love mm. this phrase that aliza licht who's a the author of on brand mm -hmm. uh a book on personal branding she says that you know imagine a trapeze artist without a safety net hmm imagine how risky and dangerous it is to be a trapeze artist and there's no safety net not having a personal brand is that in your career fascinating it's it's wonderful it's 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 i often use the metaphor of a trapeze artist in the context of transitions because very often transitions are about leaving a trapeze and grabbing the next one but but you give a wonderful addition to the metaphor which is the personal brand being the safety net which helps you you know with the uh, in the worst case scenario and help you yeah. help you helps you with the next trapeze so it's 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 wonderful and i think uh, one thing i learned from my mentor one of my mentors ravi venkatesan and he used a wonderful phrase he says very often you see noise you know people think branding is about making noise but actually it's much more about developing a voice which is much mm -hmm. more about having a point of view going in all the stuff you said being intentful being intentional and also getting the right mix between contribution and uh, if i may say uh, promotion uh, got it and and building on this lulu what i also found interesting was you use the word gentle force as your brand <laughs> <It's>, it, <laughs> it, was, it was fascinating that one could pick a phrase Uh, as a as an expression of or as a manifestation and be deliberate about it talk to us a bit, a bit about that and how each one of us could maybe pick pick something like that but more importantly expand on gentle force you know one of the hardest assignments i've had is developing my own brand idea and i mm -hmm. was forced to do so by jane garrity our former ceo who i absolutely adore she's a mentor and uh, four five years ago when i was in london you know we were chatting in one of those tea breaks and she was telling me about leadership coaching that she had gone through where her leadership coach had said that women 
and this was women in leadership, really need to hone in on their X factor. Mm. And she told me that, you know, I want you to come up with two words which have some inherent tension between them, two words mm. that are really true to you mm. and uh, describe your superpower. And mm. she shared that her uh, two words were fast intimacy. And that she's a she's one of the most brilliant salespeople in the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. And she can sit with a client and within five minutes have all of this information, which mm. is so valuable, right? As a consultant. Mm. And so that was her X factor. And she said, Okay, the next time we meet, I want you to share with me your options. Gulp, gulp. Oh my God, Deepak. It was the hardest thing that I did because I had to now take my own medicine of personal branding. And you can still write your purpose statement you can write a positioning statement but boiling it down to two words and also with and attention, not just two right? words, it's not with two attention. Words. yeah that's Correct. what she told me she said tension so first time i really bombed it like six months later she was our former ceo so i didn't get that much time with her six months later i had half an hour and mm. i developed three four options i was very excited she's like no start again <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, I really had to go back to the to the to the drawing board and a couple of people who worked very closely with me. I asked them to list all the attributes uh, that mm. they could think of with me, and I kept playing with it, playing with it, playing with it. And then, like the book, it suddenly came to me, and I said, "You know, I have to find this combination of I'm quite uh, driven, energetic. I have this underlying strength and power." But at the same time, Deepak, so many times when people meet me, the one thing that they always say is, oh, you're so humble. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this humility. I don't know why people maybe didn't expect this from me or somehow my online presence is such that they think I might be more arrogant and boastful. And then I dig dug deeper and then I had uh, feedback which said that I'm quite graceful, I'm kind, I'm empathetic. And so then I arrived at this idea of gentleness, which was Mm. a nicer word than kindness. Mm. And I like this idea of force because it was that power. It was this drive forward. And Mm -hmm. that combination, I felt, spoke of a leader who was quite driven, had focus, had a vision, but was going after that vision with a lot of, empathy, grace, and by bringing people along, which actually nicely encapsulated my style. When I shared it with a couple of people who had asked for feedback from, they said, yeah, it sounds really good. I think that's right. Um, And then I also, before showing it to Jane, I put it in chat GPT and I said, you know, what does it mean for somebody to have gentle force or to be a gentle force? And it it spat out something. I was like, oh my God, this is me. (laughs) Fascinating. So then I shared it with Jane and she was like, love it. It's totally Mm. you. Mm. And then another funny story is last year when I got promoted to being vice president of APAC, she said, and Lulu, I want you to use that gentle force, but more force than gentle. Fair enough. You swing to different parts of the spectrum. Uh, context yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have to thank Jane for firstly helping me understand that distilling it and having that tension actually creates creates mm-hmm. intrigue. But how have I used it? It's not just coming up with it. Mm-hmm. But I know that that's my strength. If I'm too forceful, I remind myself to be more grounded, to understand the other person. And sometimes if I'm too unconditional and soft, which I can be, which is my parenting style, which is all unconditional love. And by the way, in one of your podcasts, I got a lot of val- validation that that's not such a bad thing. Um, Raj Raghunathan, actually, he spoke yes, about that Maria, Maria approach versus the font trap approach. Yes, 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 yes. I love that. I was like, oh my God, finally I have some validation. Yes. So sometimes though, when I'm too much in that though, I remind myself that, hey, you know what? I need to be a little bit more forceful because otherwise mm. I'm going to be taken for a ride. So it helps me constantly calibrate mm. how I'm showing up every day and ensuring that I'm balanced. You know, ultimately, I believe one of my strengths is also balance. I always consider a balanced person. I do a lot of things, mm. uh, have a lot of different traits, uh, but I, at the end of the day, I, I believe I balance it out. Lovely. 
I'm, this is one of the things I'm going to be thinking about. What what are the two words what which which have tension, which uh, which I need to be intentional about. Uh, maybe maybe we'll chat with you separately about that. Yeah, um, you know, funny thing when I shared this in one of the podcasts last year, there were some seven hundred eight hundred women on a podcast uh, on a video interview or presentation that I was doing. And after I shared it, at least a hundred people said, that's my brand. I'm like, no, that's not your brand. Don't just mm, make it easy for yourself, know, right? It sounds great, but I'm sure that could be something more special about you. But then I'd already given it out. And so then I said, it's okay. I'll write about it in my book. It's true mm. to me and I will manifest it and embody it better than anyone else. But I did get a little bit annoyed with everyone said, that's my brand and we're going to use it. Uh, I think they should go back to the first D of the five Ds and, and exactly. discover. Uh, so, Lulu, it's been it's been wonderful uh, just uh, talking to you about your journey, about the book, and best wishes uh, with the book. If you had to distill the book into a maybe a twist, Twitter-sized message or X-sized message, as as it is these days, uh, what what would you tell the reader or a potential reader? I would say that. Lulu Raghavan's book, Go Further Faster, Shaping a Life That Matters, is going to give you actionable insights and strategies to distinguish yourself. Mm. If I had a little bit more time to talk, I would say, and to build your credibility, to create mm. meaningful relationships, and to ultimately make a mark and have an enduring legacy. Hmm. But the short hand is actionable insights and strategies to distinguish yourself. Distinguishing. Fascinating. And and Lulu, as you know, this is the series of conversations is about each one of us playing to our potential. You know, what does it uh, I find it interesting to see how different people interpret it. What does the term mean to you, playing to potential? To me, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that it's such a gift when either you or your parents or your mentors have been able to identify that inherent or innate talent that only you have, that superpower mm. that you have. So it is about knowing yourself. It's about tapping into your unique strengths. It is about strategically choosing where to play, how to win and how to grow to be the best that you can be. Mm. Mm. And so when you know that X factor, that special sauce, the value that you bring, I think you truly can be limitless mm. and maximize your potential. A lot of times that absence of self-discovery or self-awareness, I think is the biggest barrier, stumbling block to achieving greatness for yourself. So true, so true. On that note, uh, Lulu, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Pleasure talking to you and good luck with the book and everything else. It was such a delight. And I have to say, Deepak, I'm so honored that you've read the book cover to cover. You are such profound questions that I hadn't thought about either. It's allowed me to think about a lot of value that the book can have for many people. So thank you. You also showed me aspects of the book that I should be talking about a lot more. So I'm thank very you. grateful to you for that. And thank you. So, so honored to be on Play to Potential. I wish you all of the best and look forward to staying in touch. Absolutely, Lulu. Thank you.